So what we see here, Sharavi told you a little bit about it, is we see an altar. It was rebuilt by Ahab, who was the seventh king of the northern kingdom of Israel. He's very famous because he had a famous wife, Mike Ferugio, what was his wife's name? She's one of your favorite people. You talk about her a lot. Below this, we see the foundation of the original altar built by Jeroboam, the, the first king of the northern tribe, after the rebellion. And uh, you remember why the rebellion happened. You know, Solomon's son took over and he said, we're going to tax these people hard. We're going to raise a lot of money. And the wise men said, maybe we shouldn't do that. And he said, no, we're going to do it. And then the kingdom split. Yeah, so don't tax your people. Keep them together. So Jeroboam comes up here and he's like, we don't want our people going down to Jerusalem to worship the Lord anymore and turn back to the house of David. And so he offered them a place to worship. He made two calves of gold and told the people of Israel, uh, you don't need to go to Jerusalem anymore. Because what we have up here in two different locations, we, we don't know where the one in Bethel is yet. They'll find that. On one of our future trips, they're going to say, we found it. We'll go see that one. Uh, there's always something new being found here. But here's one of them. This is one of them. He said, you don't need to go to Jerusalem anymore. Come here, worship these cows, because of course, these are the gods who brought you out of Egypt. So same storyline, same catchphrase, right? God brought you out of Egypt. That's what they remember, their deliverance, but different gods. So a different story is being created. One altar set up in Bethel, the other one right here in Dan. I mean, literally, these, these are the stones down here. And you, the, you see the two different layers of foundation. And uh, we read about the kings that commissioned the building of this thing. Um, he proclaimed that the two cows were their gods. And they were the ones that brought them out of the land of Egypt. Now, what Jeroboam did here was he suppressed the truth. You see that a lot in the Bible. Suppressing the truth. God had revealed himself in obvious ways to the nation over and over again. Always pointing back to that. Remember when I did this. Remember when I did this. If, you're, if you've forgotten, eat this meal in this way. It will remind you of what I did. Always reminding them of what he did. But somehow they forgot and he came along and he suppressed the truth. Now, I don't want to talk about Jeroboam today. I don't even want to talk about Ahab who rebuilt this altar. We can see the stones that both these men had laid here. But I want to talk about the kind of children that idolaters who intentionally twist the truth would produce. People who invent religion for political gain. People who twist truth and spread lies. People who poison God's true story with themes and methods of idolatry that are contrary to God. What, what kind of children are raised up in that world? What happens when someone grows up in a world that is centered upon lies like the one that is built right behind me? So today I want to talk about Ahab's son, Ahaziah. And his complete and utter determination to believe a lie. His determination to believe a lie was astounding. No matter how obvious God was making truth to him, this guy was going to believe a lie. Now this goes down in 2 Kings chapter 1. And I'm going to summarize. Ahab died. Okay, we got that. That's the beginning of our story. Which means we have a new king. So his son was now the king, and, and he fell and was crippled and was sick. It's not clear, but we get the idea that he's bedridden. Something bad happened. So what does he do? He was raised to believe that things like golden calves were gods. And his understanding of spirituality was, so, was as contrary as it could be. Kind of like the world we live in now, right? What is the most contrary thing we can believe other than the God of the Bible, that's what we want to believe. That's what this guy was doing. And his determination to believe in a God that was not Yahweh was so strong that he said, you know what I'm going to do? I want the God of the Philistines to help me. Like the enemies, the ultimate enemies of Israel. So he was sick and injured. It was a matter of life and death. Even, as an, unbelie you know, even an unbeliever will send an Hail Mary up to God, right? Even an unbeliever, it's like, oh, will you pray for me? It's like, do you even believe in that? No, I don't, but it's worth a try. This guy wouldn't even do that. This guy reached out to Beelzebub, 
the God of Ekron. Second Kings chapter one, verses three through four. But the angel of the Lord said to Elisha, the Tishbite, arise, go to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and say to them, is it because there is no God in Israel that you're going to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord, you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. So Elijah went. So the messengers returned and told Ahaziah what happened. Listen, this prophet of Yahweh, so I don't believe in him. I believe in Beelzebub, the God of Ekron. I believe in the Philistines God. Well, the prophet of Yahweh said these things. So Ahaziah said, send 50 soldiers and get Elijah. And so they did. The 50 soldiers went to get Elijah. Here they come. We're 50 soldiers against one old man. No problem. Fire comes down, consumes those 50 soldiers. Ahaziah, you know, they say, hey, fire consumed them when they went to get Elijah. And he said, must have been a fluke. Send another 50 to get Elijah. Those 50, 50 soldiers, you know, they're going by some blackened remains. They're like, what's that? You know, fire comes down consumes those 50. When the third group of 50 went, the captain over that group, you know, he walked by some charred remains of his friends. The captain over that group pleaded with Elijah, please, we're just following orders. You know, our, our boss is a knucklehead. So he went and he pleaded with Elijah to let them live. The man recognized the power of Yahweh. He said, I, that's what he was doing. He was recognizing that there was power here. And so the angel of the Lord told Elijah, why don't you go with them? And Elijah repeated the message to the king and the king died. Now imagine the obvious displays of God's power and yet you are determined to believe a lie. God reveals himself in such an obvious way over and over and over again. It's like, nah, I'm going to believe the lie. I'm going to believe the opposite. This is what idolatry does to humans. Romans 1 emphasizes the point. Romans 1, 18 to 23. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and, and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Now, could it have been more plain to Ahaziah? I mean, it was plain. It was shown to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or um, give... Uh, or, okay, give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were dark and, dark and claiming to be wise. They became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So God's presence, God's power, obvious to the people, but men like Jeroboam and Ahab, who built this thing, who said, you know what, your God is a cow. Men like this suppress the truth and because they suppress the truth, the plain truth of God is not acknowledged, even when it's obvious. Humans exchange the glory of God for images resembling human birds and creeping things like in 1 Kings, like cows. Romans 1 goes on to say that they exchange the truth about God for a lie. That's what Jeroboam did. That's what Ahaziah's dad did. And in Romans 1, God gave them up to a debased mind. It's like, how could they think this way? Well, God let them be the way they wanted to be. It's like, if you're going to be debased, I'll let you have that debased mind. And that's what Ahaziah did because he experienced the power of God and yet he persisted in trying to arrest this guy who said such a terrible thing about him. Every idol is a perversion of God's creation. The word idol is like the word image. You know, we are made in the image of God. So we are image bearers of God. We, as humans, represent God. Every human is an image bearer of God. We who believe in God, we bear God's image with purpose. Those who don't believe in God, they bear God's image in vain. That, that's what it means, don't take the Lord's name in vain, vain. It literally means do not bear God's image in vain. What, what that means is, if you're going to be a believer, bear God's image the way you're supposed to, because unbelievers are bearing God's image in vain. So the word idol is like the word image. We are made in God's image. We are, we are like 
little imitations of God's design to represent him to the world. God made humans and humans are supposed to represent him. False gods, the fallen rulers and principalities, they wanted to be represented too. So they directed people under their rule to make idols. And when we, a people who are created as God's image bearers, worship God, we are fulfilling the purpose of why God made us. But when we, image bearers of God, worship false gods through the medium of idols, we corrupt God's plan, God's purpose so significantly that our thinking becomes twisted and backwards. This is exactly what Romans 1 says. How can people think that way? Well, there's no surprise why people think that way. God said it right here. You, people are worshiping outside of their design. In the Old Testament, we see the fruit of this altar right behind us. And the fruit of this altar is what happened with the guy like Ahaziah. In the world we live in, we see the same thing as, as people are so determined to believe in the exact opposite of what God has called them to believe. And everything we read in Romans 1 is coming to pass more and more every year. Every time you watch the news, you see it happening. The craziness we see in the world in many ways started in places like this long ago. As we continue on, let's just take a moment and just pray for our nation. Is that okay? Because our nation thinks backwards, and we're there thinking forward. We're going to continue to think the right way, but man, our nation is thinking backwards. So let's take a moment and pray for our nation, and then we'll move on. Father, we lift up our leaders. We've been told to do that. We've been told to pray for them. We've been told to uh, lift up those who govern over us. And, and Lord, we, we, we are also told to, to understand and believe that you have a plan and a purpose for those leaders. But Lord, we pray for the heart and the soul, the spirit of our nation, that you would change hearts and that you would change lives, that you would renew us to a place of thinking and living according to our design. We as humans were created to declare your image with purpose. And I pray, Lord, that we as your believers would continue to do that and we would see a change, not only in our nation, but in the world. But Lord, we're starting at home. We want to see this backwards thinking turned around. And we want to see lives uh, live for you. Not lives like this Ahaziah guy who was so determined to believe a lie, even in the face of miracles and death. So Lord, give our nation a heart change. Turn it around. Bring it to a place of repentance. And Lord, I pray that we would just see you work in a mighty way there. In Jesus' name, amen.